know, maybe you start with Alvaro and, and ask him uh, some of the, you, so you are one-on-ones and you were also in the group sessions. Can you tell us a bit about some of the general themes that you saw in, in the scene um, and, and kind of how it compares to other experimenters that you, that you went through the ecosystem and what, what it compares also to Dubai's evolution system? Yeah. Lots of uh, topics, but I guess the, probably the most recurring theme was about fundraising. It seems like there's a lot of companies... It's because you're an investor. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it was definitely a, a recurring theme, not only from, okay, so which VC, but just in general, we're growing. So this is fantastic news, I think, for you know, the, the ecosystem in general. Um, I would say definitely, and this was one of the, let's say, the three points in the fundraising, is focus in terms of who you're addressing. I think that was the, one of the insights. Um, making sure that you know who you're speaking to, if they really have an interest, if they understand what you're trying to propose, and um, if it's the right partner from, just from a chemistry perspective uh, for the long run. Because uh, I think as somebody was saying in one of the uh, later sessions, um, it's, a, it's a five to seven year roadmap uh, or, or journey that you're embarking on with that person, if he's providing capital or not. Um, I think the other theme was, was, was more around Okay, so now I have this, this great product, I'm starting to have traction, and there are many different avenues or routes to take. And depending on that, again, going back to what type of investor do I approach, um, I wouldn't be too focused on, okay, I have to go and talk to the VCs. I think it's more of a you know, spread your net, and you have to go talk to all the angel networks. There are so many different angel networks which have been created or are being created or sprung up in the past two years. Talk to VCs for sure. Talk to corporates. Yep. Talk to high net worth individuals. Um, the good thing about the fact that so many companies are showing a lot of growth and growth potential is that actually there's this region. I think the time for the region has really come of age. Yeah. Uh, actually, on that, I mean, we've been saying this for the past three, four years. The time of region has come up a page. Maybe I would ask Patrick uh, from Schwede to give us some data to reinforce that or, or to kill that. Is, is it really coming out of, are we really coming out of age? And do the ad, ad, digital ad spend that you guys see, you might want to share numbers, you might, might not want to share numbers, but is that something that's optimistic or has it been hit the last years? No, we're definitely getting there. I mean, there's still a long way to go if you compare the Middle East with the US or Europe, but monetization of uh, digital models is something that we start seeing now. Uh, it's, I mean, in other words, we believe that this market is going to continue to grow at 30-35% per, per year. Um, something in the range of $400 million per people in the list. Um, let's say, the thing is that digital, digital space, you have unlimited inventory. You're going to see more and more content, so yes, the money is coming. But at the same time, you have more, more players. So, yeah. but, so, so do you think? I mean, so looking talking to startups, you know, uh, let's say if I put my investor hat on and talk to startups, one of the things that uh, when they show the numbers, the, the growth of the numbers, I always start to think, what's the amount of independent money? And by independent money, I mean the money that's not in the pockets of the Facebooks, the Googles, the Yahoo's, or the Shreys, the money that's being up for grabs by the independent startups. Shwedi works with startups, so that's, we can put Shwedi in that bucket. So, is that growth also, you know, proportional to the growth of the market, or is it growing faster or slower? Do you think? Because let me tell you some of the things that, that we hear often hear. So, content was a big investment thing in the past. I mean, four years ago, when Maktou got sold, and then at some point, the content monetization and brands weren't spending enough, or, or startups were not getting the money in their pockets, meaning their business models for many of the of the startups were starting to be a bit more scary in terms of content. Um, and I, can, I, will, I want also Khaled to comment on that later on in terms of the content as, as an investment team. But tell us a, a bit about what you see available for startups. And I'll add to that afterwards. You go first. Well, the thing is, I mean, up to a certain level, and that's a problem with startups, uh, you cannot count on advertising to make a life. I mean, we are not going to struggle. Yes, I mean, if you have a few hundred thousands of users, you can start putting your inventory on, on platforms. 
but you're not going to make a fortune out of it. You need to be big in order to get the big budgets, the big advertising budgets. And we are here to help you, I mean, to help a few selective uh, leaders to, uh, to monetize uh, at a more important scale. I kind of, my, my sense was, to be honest with you a little bit, that's what you said, like I felt like the long tail, over the last few years, the long tail kind of disappeared to some extent in terms of advertising. But I think there's a chance for it to come back. I think the problem with a lot of the long tail advertising was, you know, there, A, the users obviously, there wasn't enough users to be relevant for some of the big advertisers. But B, also, the advertising just wasn't smart enough, right? You know, when you think about uh, targeting mechanisms, all these things, you know, the companies like Google or Facebook um, do today, they weren't available for a lot of these networks, right, for a lot of smaller players. So I think today we're going to a phase where um, through opening up our network and our capabilities to these advertisers, they can actually come back. So Shreri obviously works with a, with a, with a lot of them. Um, Facebook also opened up its audience network, right? So if you are an app now, if you are an advertiser, you can actually use our targeting, which is, you know, probably the key of what Facebook offers for your platform as well to market. Scale will remain important, but a lot of the USPs that I think the, the Googles and the Facebooks have is what are now opening up for the smaller players as well. And when you're a big advertiser um, and you say, I want to advertise on Facebook, you can click a button, oh, I'm also going to advertise in the audience network. Um, and when you opt into that, the advertising also goes um, to the smaller players using the smart Facebook algorithm when it comes to targeting, making the targeting more relevant again. So I think, I agree with you, I think uh, the, the small guys did lose out, but I think there's a chance for them to come back, in particular as demand is increasing, I think actually faster than supply. So, so as a, a global player, seeing what's happening as trends in other markets and what is appealing to, to, to advertisers, what do you think is a unique opportunity, unique untapped opportunity that Middle Eastern startups can look at that you see the trend has come to other regions but yet is yet about to come to Middle East? Well, I think there's a, there's a lot of areas. I mean, and to be honest, the, the entrepreneurs in this room will probably know best, you know, what, what the white spaces are and that's what you work on, on every single day. I, I do believe, like, if I think about, you know, white spaces, I, I personally believe there's still room in gaming, you know, for example, right, in terms of great apps that are relevant for this part of the world, you know, which are more localized in their experience. I think that, personally, I feel I haven't seen many. Um, I think that there's room for that. Um, I also still think there's room for startups from this region to go global. I think oftentimes, the good thing is that, you know, MENA as a region is big. The language goes to 350 million people. The challenge is it is also a lot of different countries, so it's not, to be honest, not just one MENA. Often your institution needs to scale, it's not easy. But also there's the rest of the world. And what I would love to see even more uh, from this part of the world is that startups say, you know what? My solution is global, you know, I'm creating a user, a user experience that works here that's also going to work in Turkey and also going to work in Germany. Um. Uh, Khaled, um, you, uh, you've been investing in Dubai for the past six, seven years as a VC. Uh, tell us what are, you know, and reflecting on what you saw today as well at Nix and Hunter, what are the, the overarching themes that you see happening in the evolution, but also the overarching trends and, and opportunities that you see and that, that excite you as an investor? Yeah, I think uh, in general what you're seeing now, what you never used to see three, four years ago, are businesses that kind of cross the million dollar revenue threshold. Uh, and those are businesses that are kind of healthy and growing, that have positive trajectory. Three, four years ago, those were really, really rare. I mean, those were, you know, we talk, we still talk about them, right? But now, I mean, you, you know, that, that's almost become the, the, the minimal threshold that, we, that, that, that you see. And I think that goes to macro trends, that goes to kind of penetration figures, that goes to um, the increase in digital ad spend, the increase in, in consumer uptake in, 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 in e-commerce, for example. So I think there's a lot of positive macro trends that are fueling growth in our segments, like technology segments uh, broadly. Um, in terms of kind of drilling down a bit into a bit more kind of depth into se segments, I think e-commerce and everything around e-commerce and the infrastructure around e-commerce uh, from the uh, hard infrastructure of logistics and innovation around that through to kind of the software infrastructure of optimize, optimization and how you kind of uh, uh, build payment pay, payment solutions, how you build uh, conversion solutions. I think there's a lot of opportunity in that. I mean, e-commerce, well, I remember like this, four years ago was, was a negligible number in terms of segment. 
Now it's approaching you know, six, seven billion dollars as, as an industry. And this was, this was something that didn't exist like four or five years ago in any meaningful way. Yeah. Um, so I think that's one thing. I think content as well. I think there are a lot of opportunities in content because where they are is difficult to see. But I think if you compare our region to uh, other regions of the world with similar kind of uh, macro uh, indicators, similar GDP per capita, similar kind of uh, dispersal, similar population size, you see the spend per capita is much on advertising, on digital, is much higher uh, as a percentage of the total pie and as an aggregate number. Uh, and, and part of the reason for that is the fragmentation. I think you, you were mentioning earlier, different countries, difficult to kind of manage uh, channels against different countries. But I think now you're beginning to really see uh, an uptick in that. And you're, you're seeing people finding ways to innovate around that, to, to yeah. be able to break down those geographic barriers. Yeah, but, um, well, going to you, so we, we talked about micro and trends. Uh, I want to go with you a bit more micro and take the, the next uh, half of the discussion in a different direction. Um, so some of the challenges that you can pinpoint that were very common at, across entrepreneurs this year and last year, and some of the big changes that you've seen between this year and last year, um, and then I'll ask you another question about user growth. Sure. Um, so I think the big challenges that are consistent last year and this year is credibility being taken seriously. I think by, uh, by especially in the B two B segment, I think. When you're building something and you want another business owner to buy it, they want to look across and see that you are a large holding company or that you have hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, there's just this kind of perception of, of wealth and success that kind of breeds wealth and success. An uh, example was someone had an HR uh, portal and they had a very unique way to help businesses. And my message to them was make sure you work with their, a competitor of the person you want to work with and have a great case study with that competitor even if you lose money on it. And when they see the value add, when they see the opportunity cost of that loss, uh, they'll work with you. Uh, I think that's the only, it, it may seem like a blunt object, but I think that's one of the few ways that people understand, uh, you know, how to, or are, are, are willing to take the risks of working with startups in this region. And, and that's two years in a row, you know, um, credibility. And, and that's, that's where mentorship comes in. That's where getting good advisors, that's where the VCs step into the fray and say, we'll help you, we'll make those intros before we do a deal with you, before we raise with you. Uh, you know, I challenge all of the mentors, all of the VCs to put themselves uh, and their reputation on the line for the startups, because that's the only way it's going to happen. Yeah. And uh, some of the, you know, optimistic trends, that you, like the changes, the challenges, and Way more they ambitious. also try to be uh, specific as much as we can. So uh, there were a couple pivots where it went from being a very regional uh, kind of catalog style site to potentially a, a global enterprise app. Um, I mean, literally moving the valuation from a 20 or 30 million uh, dollar business to like a $3 billion business or a $3 billion market uh, and creating a new market of their own. Um, a lot more structure in place, a lot more bootstrapping. So, you know, people have come out of the woodwork over the last couple of years that have been bootstrapping um, on their own, financing it, you know, just maybe doing a friends and family round, and they've got traction. They're approaching a million dollars, you know, the college went, uh, they're approaching a million dollars in, in the top line revenue. Um, they've got minimal employees. They're, if right now it's, it's in that, is this a lifestyle business or do I do a raise and, and really build this into an empire? And that's that's, that's an, an exciting place to be, and it's great to see that in the market. Um, I want to talk about the pains of scaling. Um, so we're pushing startups to go to scale-ups, we're pushing companies to hire more, we're pushing, you know, user growth is, is a subject that you talked about. I want to talk about the pains of scaling. So the pains that are not in, in user growth, they're not in revenue growth, that are come anything around it, from culture to team building to, to handling customer service, all of that. So share some, some of the insights or some of the challenges that, that you saw as much and I'm going to say as much as you can, and some of the tips that. that I mean, I can I can specifically speak to what I go through in my yeah, business. Sure. Um, you know, if if I had built this business in a different market, you know, I'd have mentors that have listed companies and gone public and sold for you know deep nine figures, and you know, I'd have a completely different set uh, and a completely tra different trajectory for my business, and that's that's super difficult for me to deal with every day. And I love my mentors and, and the people that advise me, but. You know, to feel your trajectory being held back is it's it's really difficult. So I think on the top end, you can have all the ambition in the world, but if you're still going to depend on traditional exits like potentially public markets 
or large acquirers, um, you know, we as a community need to do a lot more to prepare the startups for that. Um, there were a couple people that, you know, that on the on the fringe of the lifestyle business where they're saying, "Do I raise? Uh, you know, if I if I raise, uh, I'll, I'll do four million dirhams this year. If I don't raise, I'll do." you know, 2.7, you know, but I, I have three employees, whereas if I raise a lot, I'm seven, plus my cost of doing business goes up. So it's like, you know, really weighing that out. In any other market, it would be, or generally speaking, it would be raise, you know, get running. But I think that the investor network and kind of the investor community has a lot more to do in terms of building those deep relationships and selling in their services and their capabilities into the startups, because that should be in a slam dunk you know, the guy's profitable. He himself is making a quarter million dollars a year as a CEO of a bootstrap business. Like, that, that is a dream scenario. He's built three other businesses before for other people in lower risk situations. He's ready to make the jump. But, you know, I'm not seeing the investor community kind of come out and lay the, lay the foundation, lay the groundwork pre-deal to make the relationship with, with him and a lot of other really senior uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, I want to just see a show of hand in the room of startups who grew either revenues, employees, or any other, other key metrics by more than 50% from 013 to 014. Anyone? Okay. <coughs> I want to so volunteer for any of you to share the experience more, more about the scales of scaling or the pains of scaling. And I'd like to talk about you know, operational pains and how. If you were to start again, or if you were to grow again, go back a year ago, what were what are the things that you would do differently in a way? Cash flow. Being paid on time. Anyone? Yep. Can start here. All right. Hi everyone, I'm Tarek, the founder of Tola.com. Basically, Tola.com is uh, an online booking for restaurants where we offer real time reservations. And on top of that, we give loyalty points. So we started the company in 2013. <coughs> And uh, we've grown, not in sales, but we've grown a lot in the number of restaurants that we have and the customers that are using our service. The big challenge was when we were approaching the restaurants to sign up the deals with them is who comes first, the egg or the chicken? So we don't have that much of users that use our service and we don't have that much of restaurants to convince the users to use that service and start making their bookings. So what we did differently is we started with our network of friends, colleagues and family and they start using the service and then with word of mouth we grow on our network. If I have to go back a year ago then I would be raising funds even because we had enough cash flow as we thought that we had enough cash to grow the business we were wrong. So if I would go back again in a year I would actually raise money at the very first time that we started the business. Okay, cool. Thank you. One topic that, um, that a few friends here in Dubai and I entrepreneurs were talking about that day and, and to build on the discussion that also happened in Mexico Beirut is uh, the personal life of an entrepreneur. I want to see a show of hands who here in the room is an entrepreneur feels tired, you know, or have, has almost quit at some point, sorry I'm not to hell with it. <laughs> almost everyone. Uh, so I want to ask, I mean, if someone has, you know, we can um, and come back to the panel, but I want to ask if, if people also from the audience want to share what do they do to stay grounded? What do they do to balance that feeling? And if at some point it, uh, there was an inflection point that they almost decided to quit, but decided not to and were able to pull themselves back together. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, I think it's part of the entrepreneurial uh, roller coaster. By the way, my name is Danny. I'm the um, founder of Pixelbug. And I think uh, a lot of the, um, what, what helps support in the journey is a good team, good, good partners. Uh, they help you sort of, uh, uh, when, when you're feeling down, if, if you're complimentary, each one helps sort of, uh, uh, you know, pass on the energy to the other. And definitely uh, it's important to have a balanced lifestyle, be able to uh, take time off. I know it's sometimes difficult where you want to always keep on going, but just to be able to take a step back and enjoy some, some personal time. And uh, sometimes I do that by, by going camping or going to the desert, so just like a reconnection with, uh, with nature sometimes I feel helps. You want to go? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, it's more of just an anecdote. Like, <laughs> we were talking at Beirut, in Beirut, uh, to mix a mentor, and Saurabh uh, was like yelling at the crowd pretty much, like, take time off, like, take care of yourself. And I was sitting next to him, I'm like, there's probably a video of me being like, 
yeah, you should do that. Yeah, come on. And then, like, literally a month and a half ago, um, I got I got diagnosed with an autoimmune disease that I didn't know about, and I had been basically not sleeping for about a month and a half, and like crazy stuff, you know, crazy stuff, guys. <laughs> and uh, regardless of your age, when you find something like that out, and you discover that, and you go through that. You hit a wall, right? Because you think, "What was this for? What was all of this for? Was this this was the, this was a huge mistake? I should have joined Facebook." <laughs> uh, you know, like you, you sit there and you're just like, "What? What?" But you know, you work through it. You lean on your friends. You lean on your family. And um, my team has been super supportive. Everything's going to be perfectly fine. Um, but yeah, it was a real wake up call to take care of myself and to really like approach everything differently. And not trying to be the hero for everybody and for everybody and for every one of the team and yeah, so big wake up call for me. My name is Irfan Ahmed and we run a travel website originally called irhal.com and now it's uh, turned into a mobile application. I started working on this about four years ago as a website and my background is that I was involved in online advertising in the region, and I've been involved in it for the last 15 years. I brought Yahoo to the Middle East as the exclusive reseller, and uh, I was responsible for selling online advertising when the market value was zero. There was nobody else selling online at all, so I had to educate people and teach them about it. And one of the things I was mentioning to somebody today is that one of the challenges I had of selling online advertising is that people would ask me, is my ad going to run in color or black and white? <laughs> uh, so it was that kind of a level. But anyway, coming back to the travel website which I launched, I launched it after in 2010 uh, because at that time Yahoo bought Maktoub and I decided to switch to doing my own uh, site. It was a challenge running a site. I had money, I hired a lot of people, but the work was extremely slow. I was not looking after the site. Then I decided I have to look after it myself, otherwise it's not going to go anywhere. Once I put in my own efforts, so the typical entrepreneur, who, if he has some money doing a day job and he then gives the work to somebody else to do, I would recommend don't do that. You have to take interest in that work. Now, when you start taking interest in your work, you do have to also generate funds to survive. So you do need that day, day job. How do you balance it? By giving up your free time. That's what happens. You start spending a lot more time working and very little resting. But what really gives you that energy boost that you need? I would say don't ever forget taking a holiday, don't ever forget, I mean, you have to do those things. You have to take a day off, you have to take time out with your kids. But what is really something that gives you a boost is take part in competitions. Get somebody else to say what you're doing is good. Two years ago, we took part in Startup Weekend Dubai. We, were, we won the second prize. I think the boost that I got there, the kind of... Uh, peer recognition, the kind of um, appreciation from the crowd was such that nothing else, we were not making money on the project, but that award was enough for us to keep going ahead. This year we won the Best Islamic Economy Award last month uh, from Dubai Silicon Oasis. Again, that's given me the adrenaline, uh, adrenaline, adrenaline. Bus, uh, burst to keep going again. And I think that's what's important. Take your time out from, and you know, you do have to spend 20 hour days working, but do spend four hours sleeping. Yeah. Um, but so take care of yourself, take care of yeah. yourself, uh, and uh, make sure that you get validation from your peers, from your coworkers. Uh, one last uh, comment there, I'm gonna then come back to the panel on wrapping up the workshops. Hi everyone, I'm May from Eventus. Uh, last year was very stressful and challenging for us. Uh, we almost grow, the team grew from three person to ten and now we are eight and we, we rebranded the product and we did everything and we grew our user base and 
and customers. Uh, but it was very, very stressful. Um, I, I spent like months every day. I was telling myself why I'm doing this, and uh, um, I believe what's kept me going and uh, fighting is the support I got. I get from uh, my co-founder and the investors. Without the support from investors, I believe we have been like shutting down Eventos for a long time. Uh, so my quick advice for you is: you have to be aligned with the investor. It's not all about the money, it's about how you are, uh, you, you share the same vision and you share the same uh, mindset for the product and the vision for the product. Thank you. Good, thank you. All right, so uh, I want to move uh, into uh, ending up on um, uh, a productive note in terms of summarizing all the workshops that we went through the, the whole day. Um, so, I'm going to start with uh, content, so content monetization. The goal of the workshop was to figure out what are the best ways to monetize content, what are some of the new trends, um, and, and some of the challenges, and how to, you know, more importantly, how to overcome them. Uh, so, I'll give it to Patrick, and I don't know if anyone else also from your team uh, was here. Uh, Mahmoud, what's that? Have the... You want to come, Mahmoud? Yes, it's growing. Well, they gave it to me. Yeah. Wow. Good afternoon, everybody. Ah. Um, well, okay, so we, uh, my name is Mahmoud, I'm from Wopter, which is a medical portal, basically. And we've uh, we had a very nice discussion with even Arbon about uh, content and monetization of content. So uh, basically we went through the challenges and uh, the main challenges of, of, uh, of content and, and monetization of content. One is creating content, especially creating unique premium content high quality content, which is something that, as you know, and you need the know-how, and you need to fit it to the market. And the other thing is pricing, is how you really price that content. And from my experience, I can tell you that we're still in the very early stages of really pricing high quality content and premium content. But it's also an issue that every one that deals with content creation deals with is pricing. And the, and then the how to how to build content that is engaging, how to build content that people will come and consume and come back. And the other thing is how to build a, a ways to measure really this engagement and how to a, how to monetize it, how to bring advertising, and how to provide metrics to a, 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 a convince advertisers that what you're providing is much more effective than uh, uh, the regular advertising. Uh, so, so how to? So, okay, so we went through it, uh, uh, just I'll, I'll go very briefly. So basically one is awareness, is we need to have some kind of awareness to really differentiation of good content, high quality content. Awareness to whom? To awareness to people who produce content, is to know very basic things that like, Taking content from other websites and translating it, it is not right. Just you know, without any copyright, uh, and also for uh, for publishers, for uh, for advertisers, just to know also to differentiate good content versus uh, not uh, high quality content. Uh, the second thing is uh, understand the distribution market. Of course, if you, if you create content, you need to define who's going to consume that content and then to adapt it to really to the needs that you are creating this content to. The third thing is uh, create a product and develop a brand. I think in terms of content, credibility is something very important. So you need to also work on the brand, on differentiating yourself on a uh, top of mind, what your content is related to. Uh, and the third thing is to decide on how uh, how to reach your clients. I mean, uh, there are companies, startups in the United States that 
all what they do is just focusing on measurement of campaigns. I mean, I think what I would be interested actually um, to hear from you guys is tell us a bit about some of the discussion about the mechanics of a VC rather than what you want to see, what you want to invest in. So what happens, you know, in between emails when you when someone pitches to you something and they disappear, you're doing something, you're presenting to the investment committee, those cycles. What should entrepreneurs know for them to have a better relationship and a better understanding of that cycle and not be antsy or know when to push, know when not to push, what's happening so that you know that that box is demystified? So I think during our panel we talked about really um, when you're or trying to answer what you're saying, what happens in the background. And Khaled, you were saying, yeah, well we will receive maybe three, four, five expressions of interest on a daily basis and then people that come and actually present maybe another three or four on a weekly basis. So you're looking at a lot of different opportunities uh, throughout the month, throughout the year. Um, important there, I think we talked about four main, four main things, maybe you can help out on the, on the last one. Um, but firstly is to have you know, that, that plan, that well-crafted plan. We talked about being articulate. Uh, trying to understand and define the problem that you're trying to solve at the onset and to have it articulated well so it's easy to digest because again you're, you're as a receiver on the receiving end you're getting a lot of these opportunities on a, on a weekly basis as I said so something that's easily understandable and, and uh, cut through the next one is also sometimes we we're, we're sitting with people um, and you you're not really let's say for instance, in our case, or in your case, you guys like e-commerce. You like to look at stuff around e-commerce. Um, well, somebody who is pitching e-commerce would do well, but let's say you don't like healthcare, for instance, and somebody is pitching to you healthcare. Well, that person maybe hasn't done their homework in terms of who they're sitting in front of. So trying to understand who your audience, in terms of an investor, is, is, is key. Um, and as we said before, you know, making sure that you have a lay of the land. Yeah, I think just to add to that, uh, point in terms of what goes in the background, speaking to the two points uh, that were mentioned now, I think it's important for businesses that come to pitch to us to understand that we've raised capital from, 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 from other people. So we have investors ourselves and those investors have given us a finite mandate to deploy our capital, right? We have obviously some latitude, but we do have parameters. So there are some things that doesn't matter how much you push on, they're just simply outside the scope. We cannot you know, deploy capital outside the scope of what our, uh, our, our own stakeholders have given us, right? So I think that's something important to remember. An example for that? Like, sometimes it's stage, right? Sometimes we, you know, generally there are very few exceptions where we, we as a fund, are, in, in our fund, would do pre-revenue businesses. I mean, just be exceedingly rare and be very difficult to get through uh, to our investment committee, for example. Um, another could be geographic restrictions. So, for example, the business is mostly, up. you know, we may see Arab expats that are based somewhere else. We have a geographic mandate. We have developmental LPs in our in our fund, and they require that we deploy the capital region, uh, for example. Um, sometimes it's sector, right? We typically cannot do a very capex-heavy asset-based plays, right? That are, may involve a lot of R&D, for example. That would be outside the scope. Um, so I think those, those are some elements where uh, that, uh, that, that, that kind of entrepreneurs need to be aware of the mandates and need to kind of look at what, as they engage with the VCs, know what constraints the VCs operate under to some extent. Um, so yeah, I think that, that's... Uh, and just a, the other two points that we talked about during the panel was the team, making sure that, again, not only is it not sufficient uh, to have a well-crafted plan of how you're going to address the problem that you're trying to address, but that you also have that you're also aware of the resources required. So not only capital resources, but human resources. And at the end of the day, uh, a VC is typically a financial investor, so it can help in certain things. And obviously, you want to add value to the portfolio company, but you're not going to be sitting there side by side with the entrepreneur on a daily basis. So that, that entrepreneur has to come with at least an understanding of how he's going to go and get those resources if he doesn't have them in-house today. And the last element, the fourth element, was, was really chemistry. Look, if you know you, you come to us and you know there there isn't that chemistry, no big. You know you have to go and find the, the investor, whether it's an angel, whether it's a VC, whether it's a corporate, that you have that chemistry because it's a long road. 
And I think on the back end, the, the four points that Alvaro mentioned, what we're doing on the back end, what's meeting ends, is we go back as a team and we interrogate all of those points. So we effectively want to stress test what what that all of those means. Is there chemistry? Is there a is there a clear pain point? Is the teamwork? Is there a commercial basis? Has the entrepreneur demonstrated thoughtfulness in putting their approach together and putting their pitch together and putting their business together. So what we're doing on the back end of all of this is really kind of taking to pieces what what was said in the meeting or what's in the pitch deck and, and really kind of stress testing that. So sometimes the output of that is maybe it's not for us, right? Maybe someone else is better suited for that. And sometimes it's no, this is exactly what we can we can be part of. So there's a lot that happens in the background around that the, the target doesn't see or the entrepreneur doesn't see, which is you know, like you know, really disassembling the business plan, really kind of understanding uh, how this fits from a cultural perspective, whether the team works, whether the team doesn't work. And all of that goes on in the background, the entrepreneur never sees that. And I think it's, it's good that the entrepreneurs are conscious of this process in the background. What is, if you want to, what is the biggest turnoff that you get in a pitch or in a team coming to you? The one thing that you see and you say, oh no, just stay away. Wow, well, that's many. I mean, you'd be surprised. Yeah. What you see commonly, like for example, is someone with a, with, with insane valuation expectations, who's run some crazy DCF and says, "My business is worth two hundred million dollars, but I haven't built anything yet." And that that's just like I just don't want to talk to you anymore. Like if you really believe that, I, I don't want to deal with it. Uh, the other is tension between the founders. You see that sometimes at an early stage, and that's that's very. That's very scary to us. I think a lot of the businesses fall fall over. It could be great businesses on a great trajectory um, uh, that, that are kind of have a clear, demonstrable model that you know take all the boxes. But you can you know there, there are issues between the founders. You know we typically don't like to wade into the middle of that. That's a big turn off uh, uh, for us because so much of the value is captured within the individuals uh, rather than the uh, rather than the business itself, especially at the stages we're looking at. Uh, so that would be another, another big one. Do you encourage entrepreneurs to come speak to you even if they're earlier than what you want to invest? Or do you say just come and you're ready? Like, would you tell, if someone wants to come and talk to you now and they know that they're earlier than what you invest, do you want them to come and tell you that they exist and talk to you about it? Or you just stay away and when you're ready, come and talk to you? For me, at least, uh, absolutely. We like to talk to everyone at an early stage because this if it doesn't work now it may work at the next stage so we like to understand what's going in the market we want to be close to our future pipeline uh, there are some ways where we can I mean because we manage effectively two funds right we have a new 75 million dollar series A fund we also have a very small angel fund that's not very active but it's there and so sometimes we can find ways to to lead with the angel and then go with the series A and, and do things around that or, or we can direct uh, the we can direct the um, the, the companies towards other angel investors that, that, that would be interested in this. In the end, our interest is to see these companies succeed so that we can invest to the next stage if they're not right for us at that point. Cool. Good to know. All right, so last uh, group was, uh, all right, not last, so there's two, two more groups. So we have user and then we yeah, uh, uh, public speaking. So user acquisition uh, was a very heated workshop. Um, we had a big group there. Um, so tell us main findings of that uh, and some of the main tips that if you gave to the entrepreneurs. Cool. When it came to the challenges that the people had in the workshop, it was interesting to see some of them were more about B2B and some of them were more about B2C. Um, one key takeaway for us was to say, focus on the basics first, right? So um, make sure that you have pixels in place on your website. Make sure that if you want to use Facebook, either organically or from a paid point of view to reach the users, make sure you use the Facebook SDK. So make sure that first get the basics um, in place, otherwise don't even start with, with any of that. Also make sure that you understand who you actually really want to target. I think there's still a lot of mistakes being made where people just go, oh, I'm going to reach everyone. And no, be very clear in terms of who the customers are that you want to reach, uh, define who are the customers that are going to add value to you, and then you target just those, um, especially when you use paid advertising. Um, so have a strong CRM in place, think about who those customers are, and then target them. Um, always be open to test and learn, right? That's the beauty of many of the advertising platforms today. Once you go into pay, Make sure that you test and learn, um, because that's the beauty of it today. You don't have to spend that much money. You can first test, and then you scale up. And, and then last but not least, and then I'll hand over, what it was, as I said earlier, like make sure that you reach the people that you really want to reach, 
across the funnel. And for that, it's more important than ever to use the right solution. So once you have the basics in place with the pixels and Facebook SDKs and whatever it is, make sure you use the right solutions. And if you want to use Facebook advertising, I think for most startups, um, it's custom audiences which are using existing databases either of your website or your app, and you just target those people that are active with you already, and then lookalikes if you want to create new users, which are people that are similar to the people that are valuable to you, and we create those. Those are just two techniques that, that work very well and, and, and add installs for anyone else to create an app. So these were just a couple of, of tips. So make sure that you just target the people, um, that you don't waste your money on, on people that you don't want to reach, that you know who they are, and just target them in a very, very effective way and then learn and use analytics as well to make sure to understand what's working, what's not working. John, if I could just add a couple, two things from, from, from our session as well, which is that very often we see, especially startups, with low ball the user acquisition budgets, right? This is one thing we consistently, consistently see. It's always at the very end of the agenda and it comes too late in the equation and not enough revenue or not enough uh, budget has been allocated to this. So whatever you have put to it, Multiply at least by 5x, maybe 10x, because whatever. You, well, but no, but if, if and if you're trying to raise or whatever, very often as we we've, we've had a couple of sessions with, with with VCs as well talking about this. When you scrutinize a plan, these are the kind of acquisition costs that we see. Whether it's cost per install, whether it's you know whatever the the metric is, this is what's going in the market, and it's not getting any cheaper, right? So this is the the, the, the kind of parameters that you're looking at. So that's one, and the other one, um, again, when it comes to you leveraging Facebook. Um, there are tools that are out there. Uh, PM, what presently we call the PMDs, Preferred Marketing Developers. The assumption is that these are for late stage companies, larger companies, larger advertisers, but they're actually for everyone. Everyone who wants to use Facebook. And what they help you do is refine your objective and have tools that make it um, easier to advertise with Facebook and can very often pull in other sets of data. So they can pull in data from Google Analytics. They can pull in data from elsewhere to make Facebook work harder for you. So those are just two other things I wanted to throw in. <coughs> You want to add also, I mean, uh, some of the findings that you had because you had different sessions. I think uh, Nick will pick up on those. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, I think one of the key uh, one of the key steps you can take um, to increasing your acquisition um, across or really leveraging all the platforms, not just Facebook, um, is to look at. Sorry, John. I'm a firm believer in Facebook, but uh, there are other platforms: uh, Twitter, YouTube, um, uh, LinkedIn. That you know, I think many of you all know can produce some fantastic results. Um, one of the more advanced tactics we talked about was uh, utilizing specific URLs, driving people off-site from different platforms. Let's say, for example, you know that on Twitter, or sorry, on, on LinkedIn, you can target uh, specific job titles and industries better than you can on any other platform. But you also know that those users are also going to be on Facebook. Well, you can drive those people to a specific URL using the Facebook uh, tracking pixel. You can then retarget them on Facebook because you know that only that qualified audience has been to that URL. So. Understanding the different uh, platforms so that you can uh, you can leverage the targeting capabilities across all platforms on all platforms um, is really important. Um, one of the other uh, one of the other bits that we spoke about was just making sure that the, the overall hygiene of your uh, conversion funnels and, and sort of your your setup is um, is in place before you start advertising. So Jonathan, I know you spoke about um, having the conversion pixels, excuse me, and the tracking pixels there. Um, you also want to make sure that uh, you're effectively creating these uh, these funnels when you are setting this up. So you know that uh, as you're building up this uh, this wealth of data, that you are simultaneously building out these funnels and testing which funnels produce the best results, whether that's on an acquisition basis, engagement basis, or conversion basis. Um, so, uh, on, uh, on, a, on a content basis, we also spoke about um, what types of content um, you should be using for, for, uh, for different objectives. Uh, when is it appropriate to use a video? Um, what is the most effective format to use a video ad? Um, is it on YouTube? Is it on Facebook? And uh, is it on Twitter? Um, and I don't think there was a resounding uh, definitive answer of you know, which one is better. Um, I think it goes back to what your overall objectives are. Um, are you trying to uh, produce uh, direct sales? Are you trying to produce a, a web series uh, and inspire engagement around that? Um, I think understanding the basics of, of your objectives um, and ensuring that uh, you have a, a, a good setup and a firm, uh, a firm framework to understand how to parse that data when it comes back to you um, is, is critical. Um, I, I think uh, 
uh, Jonathan, uh, I think you mentioned something of uh, or using the SDK um, when you're developing out uh, Facebook apps. It's critically important. It allows you to do a lot more, um, a lot more activities on advertising than if you develop an app and then try and advertise it afterwards. So uh, sticking with those those basics is uh, important. Cool, fantastic. Uh, what? Uh, that, was, that was pretty much it. I think the only thing we all kind of uh, leaned on, uh, taking a hard look at Parse, um, I mean, it's pretty world class what Parse offers is in terms of a platform as a service, and you can't beat the price. You get a million push notifications a month for free. Um, yeah, you can really scale up a huge, huge mobile business on the back of Parse. And uh, yeah, I, I was at that faith this year, and the move that they made, uh, the move that Facebook made into Acquiring them and then basically making their services free or cost negligible was pretty amazing. So look at that. Cool. Uh, last workshop uh, is uh, public speaking with Dia. Uh, sure, I'm going to keep it short for everybody. Um, so if I were to summarize the two learning points that that resulted from the workshop, uh, number one, doing your homework. Uh, one cannot wing a pitch, especially if you have a VIP in front of you, like, like a potential investor or a potential uh, big client that could uh, take your business to the next level. So it's very important uh, to, uh, to know your numbers, have a solid business case, not necessarily divulge everything in one go, but having the information in mind so whenever a question pops up, you have the answer right off the bat. Uh, a second point is uh, actually to resist the urge of saying too much. Sometimes when an entrepreneur is too stressed or too excited, you start talking a little bit too much, which might put you in a tough spot when it comes to the, uh, the investor in front of you grilling you with uh, additional probing questions. So uh, we, it's all a matter of figuring out your chain of thoughts, making sure that you say less than necessary so that the person in front of you remains interested and asks you the probing questions to keep the conversation flowing. And those first 30 seconds, they are critical in order to hook and engage the person in front of you so, so that they remain interested in whatever you want to say or they just turn off their listening and they are no longer interested. And I'm guessing seasoned uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and investors, they have seen so many different entrepreneurs and heard so many different case studies over the years that they can tell right from the go if that person has a solid business idea or if that person is worth an investment or not. So focus on those first 30 seconds and establish a problem that the person in front of you can agree with in order for you to reveal your idea or your business as a solution to this problem. Uh, yeah, some, uh, some tips that you had shared with your uh, participants in terms of the delivery method, in terms of the, you know, tips that could be used in pictures but also in public speaking. Some, some of the, because I pass by and I see some of your team uh, participants but rehearsing on stage as well. So some of those key tips that people can take away using a pitch in public speaking or any other presentation. Yeah, so uh, all participants in today's workshop had the opportunity to, to deliver a one minute elevator pitch. So to get, uh, to, feel, to feel what it's like under the spotlight. Uh, it's very important in public speaking in general or in business pitching in particular to master the art of the pause. If you're gonna speak too fast, uh, it's either saying to the person in front of you that you're too nervous or uh, you're missing out on opportunity on really making an impact with what you're saying. So when you reveal an important number, pause afterwards. When you share an intriguing question, pause, uh, pause afterwards. When you, when, you start, when you finish talking about the competition, let's say, and you want to move on to your strategic financial roadmap, pause between two different parts. This allows you to relax as a speaker and this allows the person in front of you to digest what you just said. They can jot down some notes and it, it maintains a nice flow to the, uh, to the actual pitch for performance. Other than that, keeping, keep, keeping the language simple. Uh, sometimes we can get into the mistake of using flowery language or using sophisticated words just for the sake of flexing one's muscle. But really it's at the, bot at the bottom, uh, of, uh, bottom line, it's just a, a conversation that you're having over a cup of coffee. It's, it's a simulation of that. So you need to create that chemistry, you need to create that connection with the person in front of you, and simplicity always wins. I have two, I have two that I can add. So we collected um, insights and tips that were, um, that were received from the, from the participants. So at the end of the session, we collected some insights and, uh, and pieces of advice that were 
uh, thought to be very valuable from the participants. And the main two that keep on coming back is um, telling a story and including a call to action. That's why I want to share. Uh, thank you everyone for staying up with us, uh, staying playing with us. If some of you are going to be sticking around, you're probably going to go grab a bite, have an orange juice, or anything else. And uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.